It's lovely to be here, it's nice to be here, really good to be here. We've been back in the Methodist Church for a while now, but it's really lovely to come back here and that I'm looking back, been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks. We're going to be thinking about familiar passage tonight, and um, more of that later, but I'm going to start with um, something who's called a gathering. More than you imagine. Talk about a feast. Five loaves of bread and two fish shared among thousands. It is perplexing when little goes a long way with some left over. It happens again in our shared abilities touched by transcendence. And, I will hand over. This is where all changed. The hymns that were originally chosen, so I'm going to leave the, the hymn announcing to, to Take you. Take it from me. There we go. Probably don't need not a word for this, I said. Thy is the glory. Well, I mean, no. Thy be the glory. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, I will need you for shame then. <laughs> and we hope this works, otherwise we'll go back to old fashioned sheets. <laughs> Absolute old school, we go back to bits of paper. <laughs> and do you know why? The bits of paper don't break down. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Let us pray. 
this day, Lord of Light, we come to meet you. We invite you to come and shine in our hearts, to transform us by your love and your grace, that our faces might shine with your glory, that your love might be seen in our eye contact, our gentle smile, our encouraging nod, perhaps even our tentative embrace. Though we won't be doing much of that this evening. This day, Lord of Light, come amongst us by your grace, for in Jesus' name we pray. We're going to give thanks now. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. Think of something you are thankful for. Each of us has received so much, and no matter how we feel right now, there is something we can be thankful for. Let's just take a few moments now. What are you thankful for today? And if you want to say, say out loud, then please do something you want to be thankful for. I want to be thankful for friends and family who are always there when we need them in these difficult times, because they are still difficult times. I'm thankful for a really lovely harvest service this morning at the Methodist Church and such a friendly, loving atmosphere afterwards. Lord God, we are truly thankful to you. O oh Lord, you are the provider of blessings and the giver of gifts. We are your thankful people. And despite all you have done for us, despite all we have received, we have failed you and fallen short of your desire for our lives. We have stood with, stood with the Apostle Paul when we have done and said things we wish we hadn't, and regret the missed opportunity to do and say the things we wish we should have. So in a quiet moment, just say sorry to God for the things you know you've done that you shouldn't have. Living God, you accept us as we are. You welcome us into your presence, no matter what we have done or how we have let you down. Thank you for your forgiveness for us and for continuing to use us for your glory. We hear the gracious words of Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. And we bring all our prayers in the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And as Jesus told his disciples, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
Pass it back to me, and I think I'm passing it straight back to you because it's the next in. Okay, take it then, please. Yes, man. Here you go. There's a very good reason for choosing this song. One, it's on the blinking system, and two, I can play it that course. That's how we're going God's love is my fire. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He was a boy with five small <laughs> barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? <coughs> Jesus said, Make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About five thousand men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When the evening came, his disciples went to the, went to the lake, where they got into to a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. 
quite a few miracles in that story. Uh, well, three at least. I'll, we'll go through them. You can you can identify them later. But you see, what the thing is is that they were in Tiberias or near Tiberias, and they were all wanting to go home. Jesus as well. It would have been about 12 to 15 miles by road, so Jesus took a shortcut across the sea. Um, most of us wouldn't have that advantage, but we'll come to that later on. Has anyone not heard those stories before? Not heard those stories before? They're very familiar, aren't they? And even, the, even young lasses here are, you know, are, are nodding their heads. They've all, we've all heard the stories before. I've heard several explanations about the feeding of the 5,000, including somebody who once said that, well, they were so enamoured with what Jesus had to say that they all shared their lunches with each other. And they say, that's a miracle. Well, it would be a miracle in itself to get everybody to share. But I don't think it's that. I think very much that it is a miracle, just as it was written. Jesus took bread, he took fish, he blessed it, and it went around. How it multiplied, I do not know. But it did. People were all satisfied with what they got. In fact, there was a, it's interesting, I don't know if you noticed, it said that there was enough 12, low, 12 basketfuls left over of bread. No fish left. <laughs> you see, the, the fish is obviously gone. But then imagine, in a, a warm, hot country, taking 12 baskets of fish and bread away with you, it would get a bit, yeah, we know, the, we know all about that, don't we? Practical. Practical. That's what God is. He's practical. I think the simple explanation isn't that they all sat down and shared their lunch. That God reached out and met their needs. Jesus met the need of the crowd using the resources available. Perhaps we need to learn to do that ourselves. To meet the needs of those around us. To meet the meagre need with the meagre resources that we have. More importantly, we need to ask God to use us. Because we, in a sense, are God's meagre resources. Life for loaves and fishes to help me to meet the needs of the people around us. There's all sorts of things that we do. You have your coffee mornings and, and craft things. Things that bring people together. We have our coffee mornings and, and other things that bring people together. And particularly after the 18 months or so that we've had, people need to, the opportunity of sitting down and talking to each other, of supporting each other, of caring for each other. <coughs> and we do that. As I said this morning, it was lovely after the service to see people, all right, maybe not being particularly COVID safe, but at least being enjoying each other's company. That was good. The reading concludes with Jesus walking on the water, which to me, is a strange miracle. What, what did it accomplish? What was the point of it? Jesus walking on the water. Was it merely to say Jesus, because I said they were down in Tiberias, which if you look at the <coughs> Israel, you've got Tiberias here and Capernaum's up there on the Sea of Galilee, and Tiberias is there, and that's they were in that area, and they had to get up to that area up there up at the north of Capernaum. About eight, nine miles as the crow flies. And Jesus saved Jesus the walk. I don't think it was anything to do with, save, with Jesus saving his feet. I think it was to do with the fact that he knew the storm was coming. He knew the people, the disciples would be frightened. And he wanted to go to them. To bring comfort to them. To show them that he cared about them. And also to show them. So you've got that miracle. He comes to them walking on water. And they were scared. And in this account, they weren't scared 
They were scared to see Jesus. They were scared because they didn't know what was happening. But then he got in the boat with them. He realized who he was and he climbed in the boat with them. And then there's the third miracle. Have you noticed? I think that it says they were four miles out. That puts them halfway home. Jesus got in the boat and they re immediately reached shore. Reached shore. They were there. Jesus met their need, calmed their fears, and took them home. You now we could use that as an analogy for all sorts of things. But Jesus comes to us where we are and he calms us down. He takes our fears. And I believe one day he'll take us all home, but that's another thing. But in the practical sense, he took them to where they wanted to be, where they needed to be, home with their families. I don't know if you ever watch on, on the TV a, a programme about the, um, the lifeboats. And there's a program, and it's well worth watching sometimes, perhaps not every time, because it gets a bit samey, but, but there you have these brave men and women, and there are plenty of women on the boats, who go out and risk their lives. And a couple of them have said over the time that it's not them that they worry about, it's their families at home, because they know that, that their loved ones are in danger out on the sea. And yet, they have to wait. And that's often a difficult thing. So did Jesus, and I'm stretching it a bit, but I'm stretching it because I think this is worth stretching sometimes. That Jesus cared not just for the disciples, for their families, but everybody. He cared for those. Feeding the 5,000. He cared for many who he didn't know. The stranger. But he also cared for his disciples. And for all that hold him, they love. And so you think about this. It's this story of the feeding of the 5,000 and of Jesus walking on the water covers so much. It's a strange story. And I think because it's a strange, such a strange story, it's well worth believing. Because why tell the story if it's not true? So what can we learn from the miracles? Miracles happen, I believe, when they are needed. And God uses the meagre resources around to meet those needs. Sometimes those miracles can be truly miraculous. Other times they might be miraculous in the way that situations change and people are encouraged to do something. I don't, I don't think for one instance that they all shared their lunches, I admit that clear, but sometimes that happens, that we get things happen that are bring things about, people caring for each other, people, I didn't say this morning, but um, I can't remember showing um, Julia the prayers that I had, I thought she was going to do her own prayers, and when she came she did the prayers that I had at the back up. so you know, Strange things happen. And God uses those situations. Jesus cares for everyone, friend and stranger alike. And yes, as I said, I don't believe Jesus took a shortcut across the water to save his feet. But Jesus was human just like me and just like you. That sounds almost heretical, doesn't it? But Jesus was human fully human, and he knows all about the human condition. He knows about our hating feet and our bad ankles and, our, and all everything else about us. And he cares for us because of that. So the challenge for this week, use the resources that you have to share the love of God with those around you. And remember that you are loved by God. I'm never going to sing it. Yeah. 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 
Serves me right for biting my finger there. Ask me. Bristol, 
and he came to talk to us. Now, he was a lovely man, a big man, wore a big, you know, the, you know, the classic type things that they wear, you know, a robe with a brown hood, and he was a lovely chap, big, big beard, you know, he, he was typical, but Father Bear, I'll never forget his name, because that's how he, 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 he was, he, 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 he was Father Bear. And, uh, but he was telling us about how in the Russian Orthodox churches, and most Orthodox churches, they have statues all around them, the icons of the saints and the people, Christians from the ages, and their pictures and things. And then, during the part of the service, um, they go around with a big censer. You know, it's a, a thing with, a, with incense in. And they waft it. I don't know if you've ever watched them. They, they go around and they waft it so the incense goes on the congregation. So you get well doused with incense. And it goes on the statues. And you wonder what the point is of, of this story. Is that it's all about the church militant and the church triumphant. And it's all one church. We are one with those who have gone before. They are the church triumphant. So the loved ones that you knew who were a part of this congregation over the years, who have gone before us, are, a part of the, are still a part of the church. And we, now you might find this hard to imagine, are the church militant. Which, where the word, when it comes from, that's where you get the word military. The people who fight. We're militant. Now some are more militant than others. Right? <laughs> but, but, yeah, how militant are you? How militant am I? Do we stand up and fight for what we believe God wants us to? Anyway, let's come and pray. That wasn't going to be a part of my sermon tonight. But, uh, think about being in the church militant. Father of God, we thank you for miracles. We thank you for the way that you care for every person in this entire world. From the youngest to the oldest. From the wisest to the most ignorant. You love each and every one of us. Just in a, a moment, say thank you to God for his love for you. And now in a, a moment, think of the people you love and ask that they would know that God loves them too. Pray for a miracle in our world that people might discover that God loves them and cares about them and wants the best for them. There's so much to be thankful for and we thank God earlier on but there's so much need in the world. We thank God that for the way that the vaccine coronavirus has been rolled out in this country. But we pray for those in third world countries where only 4% have had vaccines. And they are probably the 4% of the richest and wealthiest people in those lands. So Father, we pray that there will be a miracle of distribution. That the wealthy countries of the world might be able to help those, who, those nations who don't have the resources. We pray, Lord, that as God used those meek, Jesus used those meager resources to meet the needs of the people, that the meager resources of the world will be used to meet the needs of all people. And finally, we pray for our week. Pray for the week that you will have. Ask that God will go before you. Ask that God will give you the resources to meet the needs of those around you, to help others. It may be only a smile or a, or a word of encouragement, but ask that you might be able to give those this week. 
those are the sort of things that aren't barriers, but there's no age barriers to those, whether we're young or whether we're old. We can all care for those around us and show the love of Jesus. So we ask, Lord, that we might know your presence with us this week. And ask that as we take you out into the world, you might do miracles through us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. I don't know if you would have been having a, a, a normal length service or not, but I've prepared a short service to my class, right?
Yeah. 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 Before then, Phil gives us a blessing. One shall we thank his gifts and then read our benediction. And yes, it's the old one, because I prefer it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mm -hmm. gifts. May they be used wisely to, one, keep the building open, but two, keep praising your name with the other churches and everybody else in this village, keeping your name well known, serving you, praising you, just as you want us to. Amen. Amen. Shall we say it together? Now the day is over. Night is drawing nigh. Shadows of the evening steal across the skies. Lord, keep us safe this night. Steal from all our fears. While angels guard us while we sleep. Till morning light. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Good night, folks. God bless. Thank you.